Hello and welcome once again to Enfield Physics Tutor, the home of all that is exciting and contemporary in A-level physics tuition. Today we're going to spend quite some time deriving the pressure of an ideal gas formula, sometimes known as the particle in a box. I guess this is one of the few places where the syllabuses have quite a long and arduous mathematical proof. And I think they do this because they want to give you a taster of what degree level physics might be like, at least in, in part. So make sure that you have your mass brain turned up to full, concentrate hard, and hopefully you'll find this interesting and useful. We start by imagining a perfect cube where all the sides are of length L. And you can see that the right hand face has been coloured in. We're going to consider a gas to be a huge number of solid, very small particles like balls, I guess, with a huge amount of space between them compared to the size of each of the particles. And what we're going to do is take one of those particles and allow it to only move in the X direction at a constant speed and consider its momentum changes as it travels. Let the mass of the ball be m and the speed of the ball or particle be u. This means that as it collides with the orange wall, the momentum is mu. After it leaves the wall, when the collision is over, its momentum is minus mu because its speed is now in the opposite direction, or its velocity, I guess I should say. Change of momentum will therefore be the final momentum minus the initial, which in this case is minus 2 mu. Our next step is to try and work out how many times this particle will collide with the orange wall in one second. Why, you might ask? Well, hang on, that will become abundantly clear. So, between each collision with the orange wall, the distance that the particle is going to travel will be 2 times L, from the orange wall to the other side and back again. Now, we know that speed is distance over time, and rearranging that, we can say, therefore, that the time to cover that distance is going to be 2L over U. Now, here's a bit that people sometimes struggle with. If you remember the formula before that period is 1 over frequency, that might help you to see that if we know the time between collisions, if we take the inverse of that time, that will give us the number of collisions in one second. In other words, the number of collisions in one second is going to be 1 over t, which equals u over 2l. Given that we have the momentum change in one collision and the number of collisions in one second, we can get the momentum change in one second, which works out as minus m u squared over l. Undoubtedly, you can recall that impulse is equal to force times time, which equals change in momentum. Therefore, we can say change in momentum over change of time is equal to the force. And since delta t equals 1, we can further say that our formula for delta p minus m u squared over l is equal to the force. But what exactly is this force? Well, because it's negative, it's pointing to the left, and that means it's the force of the wall on the ball or particle. But what we want is the force of the particle on the wall because that's what pressure is caused by. Therefore, because these two forces make up a Newton pair, we can say that the force of the particle on the wall is just going to be positive and we can lose the minus sign. So we've worked out a formula to give us the force on the orange wall if we have one particle. But we don't have one particle, do we? We have lots, and so we need to generalise. So our next step is to move on now and have lots of particles moving at different speeds, u1, u2, u3, flying backwards and forwards, but only in the x direction. And then they're all colliding with the orange wall. It's actually fairly straightforward to work out what the total force would be from all these different particles all travelling along the x direction and colliding with the wall. You just add the force from each one. In other words, mu1 squared over L plus mu2 squared over L plus mu3 squared over L plus dot, 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 dot. If we factorise this expression, we find ourselves with F equals m over L, open brackets, and then all the different speeds squared and added up. Now that's going to keep you busy. How can you possibly work out all the different speeds of, shall we say, a 10 centimetre cubed volume of gas with its billions and billions and billions of particles. Clearly, you can't. 
Well, despite this fairly serious sounding problem, all is not lost. And to help us, we will introduce something called the mean square speed. As you can see, this is written U for speed, square for square, with a bar over the top to indicate that it's the mean. This mean square speed is worked out by taking all the speeds, squaring them, adding them up, and then dividing by n, where n is the number of particles. In other words, it's just the mean of all the speeds squared. Now we can see that if we take the mean square speed and multiply it by n, then that is going to be equal to the squares of all the individual speeds added up, which was the difficult bit inside the bracket. We can therefore substitute for said difficult bit inside the bracket with mean square speed times n. And this therefore leads us to a nice simple little formula for the force on the wall caused by n particles. And that force is n m mean square speed all divided by L. In case you can't remember, what we're trying to do here is get a formula for pressure, and we have one for force. But pressure is equal to force divided by the area. And given that we have a cube here, the area of the orange face is simply L times L, or L squared. Therefore, we can say that pressure equals Nm mean square speed divided by L cubed. And of course, L cubed is equal to volume. Therefore, we have volume on the bottom. Rearranging, this leads us to a really simple and powerful formula. Pressure times volume equals Nm mean square speed. Now, what's really exciting about this formula is that we're beginning to link individual properties of particles, their mass, their average speed, to bulk properties like pressure and volume. And we'll have much more to say about the implications of this really powerful formula in part two of this video. Well done if you've reached this far, and even more well done to you if you understood it. It takes several goes to get this stuff, I find, for most students. So in the next video, we'll take the formula that we just created and go a bit further with it and generalize it for particles moving in all directions. But don't worry, we've done the really hard bit already. So, see you next time. Don't forget to share and tell all your physics colleagues about these exciting and helpful videos. Bye for now.